on this edition of Basic Meat Goat Production, we're going to talk a little bit about predator control. Predator control probably is one of the most important things that you as a goat producer can do to ensure the, the safety of your herd and that you'll have viable offspring at the end of the year to sell. When we begin to look at predator control, the first thing we need to do is, is determine what is a predator. Coyotes are probably one of the main predators that we have here in Oklahoma, followed by feral dogs, and, and pet dogs are also a close second to the coyote. The second most common goat predator, the coyote and the, and the pet dog, we don't normally think about those because we just couldn't imagine that our dogs would, would do something like that to someone's goats or sheep. Bobcats are also very efficient killers, but their population levels typically limit them to very low amounts of, of damage. To a lesser extent, foxes, eagles, mountain lions, and bears can also kill goats. When we look at predation as a whole to the losses in Oklahoma, we figure about 34% of the, the losses in our goat herds are directly related to predation. The others are injuries during birthing processes, or, or sickness or illness that, that claim about 66% of those. Out of that 34% of the, the losses that we sustain, 65% of those actually are, are done by coyotes. With 27% of being feral dogs are, are, are domesticated dogs, and then 3% to bobcats and 5% to others, which is the foxes, vultures, and eagles. Not saying that those those percentages couldn't change depending on where you are and the amount of damage that you may have in, in secluded areas. We look at the United States as a, as a whole, coyotes tend to do 60% 60, 60 just like they have, but we see the inclusion of mountain lions and bears that we don't typically see a lot of damage in, in the state of Oklahoma to. Why is control important? Because in 2004, we see that the data from the United States Department of Agriculture shows that goat losses due to predators or predation equaled about 155,000 head and equivalented to $18.3 million. Goat losses due to all other causes such as respiratory, viral, weather, are being uh, stolen by someone, 260,200 head. $33 million. This is, illustrates that 35% of the total economic deaths and loss in goat herds was due to predation. When we think about cattle or livestock, other livestock cattle operations, we have very little predation. And so cattle producers normally don't think about predation because they don't experience it like goat or sheep or other small ruminants do. If you have a predator problem, there are some definite places that you can start. Most assume that predator control involves killing the offensive animal, and this couldn't be further from the truth. Some of the most effective methods of predator control have nothing to do with killing the predator at all. It's knowing how to manage the predator and keep the predator away from our livestock. Integrated predator management is one of the, the first things that most people will try to persuade you to do if you're starting in a predator control uh, program. An integrated approach for reducing depredation is probably the most effective thing that you as a, a livestock or a small ruminant producer can do. And this relies on passive methods which are non-lethal and then a combination possibly of, of an active method which is a lethal method for control. Offers reduced predation when compared to a single method if we use multiple methods. Not a single method of approach will totally eliminate predation by itself. When we look at IPM or integrated predator management, some of the non-lethal methods are physical separation where we actually keep the predator away from the prey. Some of the cultural practices that we, can, we will talk about a little later. Predator determinant. And then we get into the lethal methods, which are predator harvest. When we look at the non-lethal methods, we begin with physical separation. That is 
one of the biggest one is fencing, where we actually build a fence that will not allow the predators access to the property where the, the goats or the small ruminants are. Kidding sheds and night penning. Those are all very, very good methods of, of slowing down predators because we keep them actually where they can't get to have access to the, the goats. Cultural practices such as day herding, removing carcasses, habitat management, culling weak animals, and, and using fright tactics will also be very effective. Predator determinant or fright tactics and the use of guardian animals. There are others that we won't discuss at this time, but we'll talk a little bit about each that we've mentioned up to this point. Fencing, when we begin to talk about physical barriers, some of the research studies have shown that adequate fencing is the most effective management. You need good fences to produce goats anyway. It takes very little management to make a goat fence that is predator management as well. A well-constructed fence should repel most predators. Even though they have a high initial cost, that can be alleviated when we begin to reduce goat losses. When we begin to look at fences, apron fences are very important because they extend out from the bottom of the fence and that keeps the, the coyotes or feral dogs from digging under. And we can put those into fences that are already in, in existence, but the fences need to be buried so there is going to be a, a high amount of labor and cost associated with those. If we're going to look at kidding sheds or jug pens, we remove goats and kids from high risk areas. We keep those, those kids in, in a location where we have under close surveillance and have very secured while those, those goat kids are very uh, susceptible to predation during their very young you know, infant time. Locate those sheds. If you're building a kidding shed in an area that is in close proximity to houses or barns where coyotes are very hesitant about approaching. If you're using a holding fence around the shed, this should be built using impenetrable wire. Uh, barbed wire will work well, but also other forms of net wire may be used. And these can also double as a relief from, from bad weather if they're needed during times that, that we have inclement weather in, in times other than kidding. Night pinning is very popular in some areas, especially for small herds near very uh, predator abundant areas. And it's feasibly determined by herd size, grazing distance from the pen and, and facilities. These are very impassable to the, the predator and they're normally close to barns. And these will take a little bit of increased time and labor, but they have proven to be effective. The increased time and labor is you have to go out every evening and, and coax those animals to that pinning location and then go out every morning and release them to go back out to graze. The other, uh, the other advantage of night pinning is it makes, if you're using guardian animals, it makes their job a little easier because they are in a close proximity to the animals and the animals are all kept together in a close proximity to each other, making it easier for the guardian animal to watch them. Some of the fright tactics that are used that, that throw the, the predator off of its natural uh, routine these devices are triggered by motion sometimes that tend to be most effective because they're not going off in a pattern. They're only going off when something triggers it into motion. Acoustic scarecrows with a strobe light have tended to be very popular because it, it scares the predator. You know, it reduces their want to, to approach a place where they've been scared off of somewhere like that. Time devices and wind-powered objects showed poor performance because the predators grow used to them. Hanging a dead coyote, as we've, many of you have probably seen, people kill a coyote and hang it on their fence. That's shown to, to not be very reliable. We don't really know if that works or not, but to a lot of producers it makes them feel better just because they feel like they've accomplished something. Another option that you as a producer have is to remove dead animals. Carcasses after birth should be removed from pastures or pens. 
because those only seek to attract predators to your location. And it also gives them a, a taste of, of what you're trying to protect and, and develop, they develop a taste for the, the animals that you're raising and then they start to seek them out to kill them even though maybe they didn't start out that way. Some of the ways that you can remove the, the carcasses or, or bury them, incinerate them, are one of the newest and probably best methods that we've seen is, is properly composting them and turns them into a useful product somewhere down the road that you can actually use on your own operation for fertility purposes. What these do is they minimize smell and eliminate that first meal from the predator. We do know that some guard dogs will clean up remaining after birth. There's been some disputes on whether or not you know, producers should allow their guardian animals to, to clean up after birthings or, or dead animals, carcasses, but the, what they do is they reduce the amount of of opportunities for those predators to come into your operation or in your property. Also, if you have animals that are weak and, and beginning to lag behind and not stay with the herd, you definitely want to cull those or put them up in pens where they're not as subject to predation because predators tend to prey on the weak and those that don't fit into the herd. Some of the habitat management is try to prevent goats from unprotected grazing when they go into dense cover because if it's dense cover it's it's good cover for the predator. Coyotes and bobcats rely on this cover to to ambush their prey, to have a, a fair chance to overcome their prey. If they have brush piles or briar thickets those attract rabbits which are another calling card for predators bringing them into to close proximity to where your animals are grazing. And then how do we use goats to control this brushy growth if, if we can't do that because of predators? It's possible to restrict the movement of goats just to the areas you want them to clean up. Initially intensive grazing in these areas in daylight hours only. Later once the cover has been opened you can continuously graze them if it's a possibility. And then also the use of a guardian animal for protection is always a good idea if they're going into very dense cover where, where predation may be a problem. One of the, the big factors that we see in, in predator management is, is guardian animals. Livestock guardian animals are not a necessity. We see a lot of very successful goat operations that don't have guardian animals, but they are very useful to, to some and, and, and have the utmost importance to others. If you've utilized some other passive methods, you may not need a guardian. If some of the other passive methods have been successful, then a guardian may, may not be necessary. But if you've tried some of these other passive methods then, and, and had no or little success, then that may necessitate a, the use of a guardian. There are a variety of livestock guardian animals available. Probably the most popular that we see is the dog. We have had good reports of people that use dogs. We've had people that had bad experiences with dogs. Same thing holds true for llamas and donkeys on, as well. Depending on the producer's goal and the management practices, that may dictate which of these guardian animals works the best for you. If you have a laundry list of passive methods that you've implemented, then, then maybe you can skip the guardian animal. When we begin to look at the livestock guardian dog, the dog, many times the question is, how do you train a livestock guardian dog to do his job? The, the most livestock guardian dogs work on instinct. It's, it is present without human interference. That means we don't train these livestock guardian dogs to do their job. They do it by instinct. However, all major dog breeders agree that some training is essential for guard dogs. Mainly it's, it's being acclimated to humans to be, under, be able to understand voice commands to some degree. You want one that's friendly, someone, one that you can lead and tie. What that does is that allows those, gu those guardian dogs to be vaccinated, to be handled at, at a 
at a point in time that if they need to have veterinarian attention, that, that can be accomplished. If the, go, if the dogs can't be caught, can't be tied, then that, that may not be a possibility. The other thing is if you use cable restraints, if you use snares and those dogs are actually uh, captured in the snare, if he's used to being tied up, he won't fight the snare and, and potentially suffocate himself. Time spent with pups should be productive, but they also should be in short bursts so that the, the pups don't bond with the humans and they, we want those pups to bond with, with the goats instead of us as their, as their handlers or, or the humans that they associate with them. There have been no differences in protection levels between breeds in any research study to date. It, it is much like goat breeds. There are some people that are very adamant about one breed over another. There are some goat producers that are very adamant over, of one dog breed over another as well. Nor has there been any, any shown in differences between female and intact or neutered males. While neutered males were probably less likely to wander, there were still a lot of instances of neutered males that wandered outside the boundaries of their property line. Producers should pick a breed that is based on availability and other factors discussed that we've talked about. You want to try to find a breed that is readily available so that if you need replacement dogs, that they are available to you without having to travel long distances and paying great amounts of money to, to purchase those dogs. Some of the more common breeds of dogs that are used, probably the Great Pyrenees is one that we hear a lot about because of its, of its large size and, and gentle manner. The Anatolian Shepherd is another. The Anatolian Shepherd comes in, in two different types, the, the long-haired and the short-haired. The Akbosh, the Marema, which the Marema looks a lot like a small version of a Great Pyrenees. And then the Commodore. The Commodore looks like a rag mop and it has very, very long uh, hair that tends to be a problem in some areas, but, but a very good dog that is very loyal to, its, to the herd that it's protecting. All of these dogs are, are very loyal to, to the animals that they bond with. They are used by many people as pets and protect homes, as well as protecting livestock. So it's, it's very hard most of the time to find a dog that will do both at the same time. If you don't have a dog already and you're, you're beginning in your conquest as a goat producer, the first purchase that you would want to buy as a dog is an adult dog. It, it's very difficult to start out with a puppy and, and new goats because that puppy may not have the ability to, to truly and adequately protect those goats from a predator problem. Prices range from, for an adult dog from 300 actually it says 500, but probably the sky's the limit for a real good dog. Uh, most producers are, are very hesitant, if at all, willing to, to part with an adult dog that is very adequately prepared to, to defend their animals. But if you buy an adult dog from a, a reputable breeder, you can be assured of what you're getting. Those adult dogs can then go on to help you train future pups. Don't be persuaded to buy dogs from local newspaper ads or free to good home dogs because you may be purchasing a problem that someone else is, is trying to get rid of. You also may be causing yourself a lot of undue heartache because those dogs aren't prepared and aren't bonded with the animals that you want them to protect. Find a reputable breeder for the best genetic lines. Those reputable breeders will be a wealth of information to you and can help you a great deal in your selection of a dog. If you look at the maintenance cost of a dog, when you begin to look at a maintenance cost ranging from $150 to $250 per dog per year, that's vaccinations, worming, and feed. You figure that most of these dogs, the calculation is most of these dogs will eat between two and three pounds of dog food a day and so you can calculate that, plus rabies vaccinations and, and other deworming and other veterinarian issues. 
if the purchase price of a dog is $500, you depreciate that over five years, that's $100 a year, $200 a year for maintenance cost. You're talking about a little less than a dollar a day for a, a guardian animal. If you sell a 70 pound kid at today's price of somewhere around $2, roughly two kids a year will pay for that dog. Predation will dictate that you can lose a lot more animals than that in a short period of time without some type of predator management. When you begin to look at $300 a year, that's a pretty cheap employee on your operation. You can't hire someone for $300 a year to watch your goats the way these dogs will. This training doesn't, this cost doesn't account for the value of training younger pups that will be future guardians on your operation. To talk a little bit about llamas and donkeys as well, some producers have had success with these species. However, some studies have proven that llamas and donkeys are, are less pr productive or less efficient than, than guardian dogs. Some of the benefits of these animals is they're, they're not as likely to be captured in traps or snares because they're not going through the fence, they're not trying to access other pastures, and they're less likely to kill or injure goats while there have been some instances where llamas, especially intact males, have killed goats. Uh, they're not as likely to. And they do eat the same forage that the goats do, meaning that you're not having to supply them with, with a separate or different type of, of feed and then worrying about how you're going to keep that feed away from your goats. Some of the drawbacks about llamas and donkeys is in the case of large predators such as bears or, or mountain lions, possibly wolves, llamas and donkeys are not going to stand their ground. They're going to, to flee the scene and, and then possibly leave your, your goats in, in the path of a, of a very large predator. And they must be carefully introduced to the herd. Both male llamas and donkeys should be neutered or castrated to be effective. Also, if you're going to use donkeys, it's recommended that you only use one per herd because if you use more than one, they tend to bond with each other rather than bonding with your goat herd. And also the use of these depending on your herd and your management. Some, other, some of the lethal methods that we've talked about, up to this point we've talked about the passive methods, now we're going to talk a little bit about lethal. The, the shooting of, of predators, either by aerial or, or calling into rifle range, hunting, them, hunting predators with dogs, Denning, trapping, snaring, the uh, livestock protection collars, and the M44 cyanide, sodium cyanide bombs. The lethal methods probably should only be used if path passive methods have failed or if the predator problem is so severe that, that uh, when starting a new herd. <clears throat> These typically do nothing to eliminate the problem animals since 89% of the lamb kills in a 14 year study was done to alpha coyotes. Alpha coyotes are, tend to be the hardest to, to control because they're very wary. They are very sneaky and we typically don't catch them in a situation where we can control them. Can actually cause further problems if we use too many lethal methods too often in the fact that we repopulate animals that may actually become goat killers that weren't. The example of this is if you just shoot every coyote that you see independently and you're not having a coyote problem, what may happen is you, you control all the coyotes that are in your area. The coyotes that move into your area after you've controlled all of those may actually be the ones that are, will start to cause you problems. If you do determine that lethal control is warranted, it's best to get the guidance of your state game warden or your livestock, I mean your local wildlife control agency, they'll be more than glad to help you and most of those guys come out and, and help free of charge. There are several advantages to controlling predators yourself, but you have to understand that you can definitely make those predators uh, very savvy to what is going on and if you do, uh, do cause some of these problems, it may make it harder for the professionals to control them a little later if, you, if that comes to that point. 
Hunting can be an excellent and inexpensive way to control a predator population because most hunters are looking for an opportunity to, to hunt some of these predators such as coyotes, but you may want to spend a little time with them before you just turn them loose on your place to let them know what your expectations are, where they can hunt, where they can shoot, so that everyone is on the same page and that you that you're very satisfied with the results. The majority of predators harvested will be young. However, it's also a good way to harvest the alpha coyotes where calls have not been overly used. If calls have been used to a great deal, those alpha coyotes become aware of that situation and will not approach a, a call that they know is, is manufactured. The other option that you have is trapping and snaring. Trapping and snaring is probably best done under the advisement of a, a state game warden because predators can quickly become very trap shy once they see other predators captured there and then it becomes very difficult for professional methods to or professional trappers to catch those coyotes. Also if you have traps that are set you definitely want to be very conscientious of your your own guard dogs as well as alerting your neighbors that that you have those snares set out so that you don't accidentally trap one of their dogs. The M44 and the livestock protection collars are both regulated in Oklahoma and can only be used by professionals. The sodium cyanide gas discharge bombs, the M44s, are very effective. What happens is, is a piece of bait is placed on the end of a pull cord. The predator will pull that and it discharges the sodium cyanide into the face of the animal and, and death is almost instantaneous. The livestock protection collar is placed around the, the neck of animals that are normally weak, that contains a gel pack of, of the toxicant cyanide. So it's placed around the neck. That's where most of your predator attacks are gonna take place is in that neck area. So that when they bite that, that pack of that gel containing toxicant, they will get that and, and absorb that orally. And, and normally death is pretty close after that as well. We look at predator control in closing. The most successful predator control efforts have been a combination of many of the passive methods with the inclusion of active methods when necessary. You know, one method will not normally be adequate for predator control in most situations. It's not a one, one size fits all method. So you have to be very willing to evaluate different methods to see which one best fits you. Also being, uh, being ahead of the game, don't wait until predation has occurred before you implement control practices. If you can be proactive and start on some of these passive methods before predation has actually started, it's a whole lot easier to prevent than it is to control once it gets started. This has been a, a few pieces of information that you can use on predator control. I hope these, these things help you and help keep your animals safe. Thank you.